Good morning, Pramod Sharma, Shamir Dash. Do I pronounce your name correctly? On YouTube as well. Good morning, Pramod Sharma, Shamir Dash. Do I pronounce your name correctly? <clears throat> Very good slides from uh, Jessica. And uh, Jessica is gonna be speaking in uh, Portuguese. And then I will translate into English. But uh, she, uh, her English is quite okay, but uh, not 100%. But uh, in time, she's gonna be ready for the presentations in English. But I'm here to translate and uh, that's okay. <clears throat> Good morning, Rodrigo Morato. How are you? Good morning. Fine, and you? Uh, 100%. I'm here in Brasilia. And, uh, we are waiting for people to catch up. So we... Professor Natarajan is in, so let me make him go host. Good morning, Professor. How are you doing? Very good. How are you? I'm fine. Good uh, day. Yes. In I the... went to the hospital and then came back just now. Oh, yeah. It's starting to get uh, sunny here in Brasilia. And, yes. Uh, very I can nice see day. Jessica's screen. Hello. Good morning, Jessica. Welcome to the program. Good morning, Dr. Natarajan. Good morning. How Jessica, are you? Uh, Jessica is going to be speaking in Portuguese, but I, I think she speaks some nice English, but uh, for the first time, she prefers okay. speaking uh, in uh, Portuguese. I would translate. And uh, the good thing here, <clears throat> as was telling uh, uh, our uh, residents and uh, fellows, that uh, the best thing here is to interact among yes. us. And so yeah. everybody learns, and uh, it's uh, it's good for for all, and for our, our teaching as well. Yeah. So we have a uh, Aishwarya there. Dr. Rodrigo is there. Carlos is there. And I think yeah. Dr. Manasa, Samir, and Pramod are they, are they all from Orissa? Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Dr. Manasa? Sir, yes, sir. I can hear you, sir. Yes. Uh, what about, Dr. Manasa, uh, where are you from? Where are you from? Sir, I am here uh, working at Vision Care uh, Center for Retina at Bhuvaneshwar. Very good. Uh, okay. Under Dr. G. N. Rao. Right. Okay. So, is Dr. G. N. Rao joining today? Yes, sir. Yes. I am joining, sir. Joining, sir. Oh, you are already joining. Very good. So we have Dr. Amit Jain, he has joined. Amit Jain is a consultant here. And then Dr. Jaydeep is joined. Hi, Jaydeep. I, I was missing you. I thought you, you were not coming in. <laughs> Jaydeep is a very good uh, Good morning, everybody. Yes. Jaydeep? Amit, uh, good afternoon to you, Amit. Good morning, good Jaydeep. morning, Amit. Yeah, good morning here, good afternoon there. <laughs> it's interesting. Good afternoon, sir. Good morning, Dr. Hudson. Good morning. How are you doing? Good, good. So, so uh, yeah. yes, Jaydeep, sir. you were just saying, Dr. Jessica is on the already loaded her screen. And uh, okay, is okay. Jessica try talking in English or only in Portuguese? She's going to be talking in Portuguese, but uh, you know her slides are uh, very understandable. Uh, understandable, okay. and uh, okay. so I will be translating soon after yeah. she speaks. Yeah. Okay. So to make things flow, it's not a, a long talk, but it's okay. something to. Uh, good morning, Nakel. 
Nageshwar, Rao, how are you doing? Retinosome participant. Yeah. Very good case in the Red Nostrum meeting last Saturday. You know, we loved that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to see Colin and the internet. Yeah, that's it. Okay, I will just change my name. I think. So, Jerry, if you all agree, we can start. Yeah. Yes, sir, we can start. Okay. So, I think all can mute except. Uh, you are ready, Jessica, to start? You you have already your screen. It's very good. Very, and uh, so whenever you want to start, Jessica, just uh, let me know. Tá pronta? Pode começar, Jessica. dando uma interferência aqui, Maybe YouTube. Maybe maybe somebody has YouTube on. No, okay, it's uh, okay. off now. It's just I just have the mics, uh, my mic and your mic, Jessica, on. Só o meu microfone e o seu estão ligados. So that's okay yes. for me. After the English version. I will jump to the Portuguese version very short, so don't worry about that. Can I speak in Portuguese? Ah, yes. Okay. Dr. Jessica? Então, vou falar hoje sobre a fisiologia da retina. Great, great, Jessica. Go ahead. Iniciando pela citologia, vamos conversar um pouco sobre as funções de cada célula da retina, que compõe a retina neurosensorial e também o EPR. So, we starting from cytology. I'll go back one slide, please. We're going to uh, vote one slide. We're going to start from the cells that make the neurosensorial retina and also the retinal pigment epithelium. Os fotorreceptores são os primeiros neurônios da via visual. The photoreceptors are the first neurons of the visual pathway. O segmento externo é composto por pigmentos que absorvem a luz e vão participar da fototransdução do estímulo visual. E o segmento interno corresponde ao núcleo celular. So we have the external segments. From the uh, that uh, have the uh, visual pigments that absorb light in the inner segments that have the bear the cell nucleus. São divididos em cones e bastonetes. So we have cones, cones and rods. Os cones nos dão a visão de detalhes e cores em condições fotópicas e são divididos em vermelhos, verdes e azuis. E o pigmento é a iodopsina. So for the cons, we have the detailed color and color vision in photopic conditions. We have the left, the, the uh, uh, red, the green, and the blue, and uh, the pigment iodopsin. Bastonetes, por sua vez, nos dão a visão noturna e, e visão de movimentos e formas grosseiras. Eles têm uma sensibilidade máxima a pequenos estímulos de luz podendo responder a um simples fóton de, de sinal luminoso. So the rods, we got the night vision of movements and the coarse forms. And uh, at very low light levels, we have the maximum sensitivity responding to one, uh, uh, one single photon they respond, the rods. A visão grosseira que ele nos proporciona é devido ao fato de que cerca de 20 a 100 bastonetes convergem o sinal para uma única célula bipolar e uma única célula ganglionar. E assim não conseguimos ter visão de detalhes. So the rough and not very uh, focal or uh, focused vision is due to the, uh, because uh, 20 to 100 rods converge signal to one single bipolar cell and one ganglion cell. So that's why the vision is not so very accurate. E eles capturam é, comprimentos de onda médios e pequenos que ficam entre a faixa de azul e verde. 
So they capture a medium and small wavelengths and between green and blue. And the pigment is rhodopsin. Os, inter, os interneurônios, eles correspondem aos neurônios que fazem o circuito local e fazem associação, modulação e transformação do, das informações da via visual. So interneurons, uh, local circuit neuron, they uh, do the association, modulation and transformation of visual information. As células bipolares são os segundos, o segundo neurônio da via visual e conectam os fotorreceptores às células ganglionares. Os, os bastonetes, eles se ligam apenas a bipolares do tipo ON e os cones do tipo ON e OFF. And so the bipolar cells are the second neurons of the visual pathway. This is very interesting. They are uh, very important cells. They connect photoreceptors and ganglion cells, meaning that the rods, they connect to the ON and cons to the ON and OFF. E ainda temos as células horizontais. And also in between the uh, horizontal cells that uh, connect bipolar and photoreceptor cells, as you see in the drawing on the left. Agora a máquina. Ah, falar da máquina, Jessica. Volta. Conecta, conecta as células bipolares com as células ganglionares, fazendo a modulação do estímulo. The uh, micron cells connect bipolar and ganglion cells, making uh, the stimuli, the stimuli modulation. As células gangliais fazem parte do suporte da retina, e entre elas a principal é a célula de Miller, que é a maior célula da retina, e ela se estende da membrana limitante externa até a membrana limitante interna. So you have here the glial cells, and uh, there are supporting cells, and the Miller cells, it takes uh, all a retinal extension from the uh, internal limiting membrane to the external limiting membrane. E os astrócitos e micro, microglia, que são células estreladas que envolvem fibras nervosas e pequenos vasos da retina. In astrocytes and microglia, the steric cells involve nerve fibers and uh, small vessels as well. Células ganglionares são os terceiros neurônios da via visual e pode ser dividido em magnos celulares, parvos celulares e bistratificados cones celulares. So ganglion cells, the third neuron of the visual pathway, magnocellular cells, uh, M cells, transmit information on movement, location and depth perception. Parvo cellular cells, P cells, transmit signals about details, shape and texture of, of objects. And uh, bistratified corneal cellular cells, the K cells transmit signals about the colors of objects. As magnocellulares são células grandes e que têm uma condução do estímulo nervoso rápida, enquanto as coniocellulares são as menores e têm um estímulo, uma condução de estímulo mais lenta. As parvocelulares ficam tanto de tamanho mediano quanto a condução à velocidade mediana também. The uh, signal conduction for the magnocell cell, cell, cellular cells are the highest, and the by stratified the conocellular cells are the lowest, and parvocellular cells are uh, some uh, in between the both, in between the two. As funções do EPR temos primeiro a absorção da luz através de grânulos de melanina. Elas previnem a, dif a difusão da luz e com isso melhora a qualidade visual, além de estabilizar através dos melanossomos os radicais livres. So we have the RPE functions here. The uh, first function we mentioned is the absorption of light from melanin granules, preventing light diffusion and improve, improving visual function, and uh, free radical stabilizing melanosomes. Também participam da barreira hematorretiniana através das zônulas de oclusão, evitando que o fluido da córeo capilar penetre da parte retiniana. So we have the blood retinal barrier, we have the zona occludens here, so we have these barriers preventing uh, from uh, entering the, uh, these areas, so it's a kind of a barrier to blood, let, uh, blood retinal barrier, zona occludens. 
fazem parte do transporte de nutrientes e íons entre os fotorreceptores e a córeo capilar. Então, eles removem o líquido subretiniano através de bombas de sódio e potássio na zona apical da célula e bombas de cloro bicarbonato na zona basal da célula. Também transportam a glicose e o retinol, que faz parte do, roda, do pigmento de rodopsina. So another function from the RPE is the transportation of nutrients and ions between photoreceptors and coral capillary. This communication is important. Uh, the, uh, for subretinal liquid removal, apical uh, sodium potassium pump and chloride bicarbonate in the basal uh, glucose and uh, retinol as well, as we mentioned here, rhodopsin component. A outra importante função é a renovação do pigmento do fotorreceptor através da devolução do 11-6-retinal para nova novo uso na via visual e também fagocitam os discos degradados dos fotorreceptores. Another function is to renew pigment phagocytosis, phagocytosis degraded photoreceptor discs. Como função secretória, eles produzem dois importantes fatores. O fator derivado do epitélio pigmentar, que ele é, é secretado em direção à retina neurosensorial, e ele tem fator neuroprotetor e antiangiogênico. E o fator de VEGF, que é produzido e liberado em direção ao, ao acório capilar, que previne a apoptose das células endoteliais, e mantém as fenestrações da córeo capilar abertas. So we have here PEDF and VEGF production, secretory factor derived from the RPE, neuroprotective and antiangiogenic, and VEGF prevents apoptosis of endothelial cells, stabilizing of córeo capilar fenestrations, and also the function of immunosuppression. So the RPE has um, many, many functions. Falando um pouquinho sobre o ciclo visual de Walt, que envolve tantos fotorreceptores quanto o EPR. Começa pela absorção de um foto de luz, que vai induzir uma isomerização do 11 cis retinal em ao trans retinal, que é a forma excitada da molécula. Como so consequência... We have the light absorption biopsin and uh, we have uh, a rhodopsin there and uh, uh, the conversion from uh, one type to trans to cis. Com isso, é feito nos fotorreceptores, esse ao trans retinal, ele é absorvido pelo EPR e novamente transformado em 11 cis retinal, que é devolvido aos fotorreceptores para um novo ciclo visual. So the visual cycle, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, the other way around from cis retinal to trans retinal. And this cycle is uh, heading back to the same uh, cascade. Então, a fototransdução, ela vai gerar um sinal elétrico através de uma excitação do fotorreceptor. O fotopigmento ele vai estar localizado na membrana do disco e ele vai ser composto por duas partes, a opsina, que é a parte proteica, e o retinal, derivado da vitamina A. So the photon of light hits the photoreceptors, uh, getting the uh, electro signal. And then the photopigment on the disc membrane uh, produces opsin protein plus retinal. Nos bastonetes, a rodopsina, a absorção máxima de luz acontece nos comprimentos de onda perto de 500 nanômetros, que é azul e verde. The rods, the uh, rods and the rhodopsin, maximum light absorption is from uh, 500 nanometers, blue green spectrum. E nos cones, a iodopsina vai. É, absorver os comprimentos de onda azul, verde e vermelho. So for the cones, the adopsin absorbs the uh, wavelengths from 430 uh, blue, uh, 540 green, and uh, 600 red. 
e tudo isso vai ser iniciado a partir da hiperpolarização dos fotorreceptores. And that, all that starts with the hyperpolarization of the photoreceptors. A hiperpolarização dos fotorreceptores ocorre devido a quando temos um estímulo luminoso, a proteína G transducina vai ativar a fosfodiesterase que vai quebrar, hidrolisar o GMP cíclico em 5 GMP. E esse vai fechar os canais de sódio. Então, bloqueando os canais de sódio, temos um, uma parada do influxo e a célula fica hiperpolarizada. So the cell gets hyperpolarized and we have here the rods in the dark. The uh, uh, sodium channels are open and uh, the uh, dark current sustained depolarization glutamate tonically released bipolar and horizontal cells. And the light is absorbed and uh, activates G protein, transducine, photodiesterase, degrade uh, cyclic GMP by hydrolyzing cyclic GMP into 5 uh, GMP. Então, aqui no escuro, nós temos o fotorreceptor bipolar e a célula ganglionar. No escuro, a a célula de fotorreceptor vai estar despolarizada. Com isso, vai ter uma liberação tônica do glutamato. So e aí, the dark, the dark, the photoreceptor cell will be depolarized, and then you have the uh, release of the uh, glutamate, glutamate at this time here. Com isso, a célula bipolar ficará inibida e aí nenhum neurotransmissor vai ser liberado por ela e não vai ter potencial de ação. E aqui temos o repouso. So in that way, uh, the cell is going to be inhibited, the bipolar cells, so there won't be any stimuli. So that's what uh, the uh, action potential will be, you know, like with no, no, no response. Com o estímulo luminoso, temos a hiperpolarização do fotorreceptor e ele vai parar de liberar o glutamato. So with the light, we have the uh, photoreceptor hyperpolarization and he's gonna, this is gonna stop the release of the glutamate. Com isso, a célula bipolar não vai ser inibida e ela vai liberar o neurotransmissor na fenda sináptica e vai gerar um potencial de ação na célula ganglionar. So the bipolar cell won't be inhibited. It's going to uh, release the neurotransmitter and then you generate an action potential. So there is difference between dark and light. Thank you. Sorry, I don't speak English. <laughs> you speak? It's a pleasure <laughs> learning from you. Yeah, very interesting to go this uh, Wonderful presentation. Jessica? Obrigado. Thank yeah, you. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. And maybe Dr. Nageshwar Rao and Dr. Amit Jain and Aishwarya can all over Jaydeep. But I think uh, real biochemistry, which is the most important, which happens in the basis of AMD and even the drugs. And that's why I think the light, I think you have to understand. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Jessica, very nice presentation. Uh, very uh, lucid and uh, uncomplicated presentation, I should say. And I'm sure uh, everyone who is listening must have understood it very clearly. And thanks to Dr. Hudson's translation. Thank you. Yeah, that so, was interesting, and uh, we have to understand. I guess. Uh, for us, it's, it's kind of a refresher course. I mean, it's been a really long time since we heard yeah. about the physiology. Correct. Yeah, that's But why as Dr. Natarajan said, yeah, it's the basis for all uh, mechanisms for most of the conditions in the retina, the medical conditions and the way drugs work. We should really know this very well. Yeah, we should know and uh, we have to remind of all these uh, uh, teachings when we get into the surgery because uh, otherwise you won't know 
uh, the RPA has so many functions and uh, that's what I wanna, uh, in practical terms, we divided this uh, lecture uh, from, you know, basic. And now I'm gonna uh, show you something very more uh, specific, of course, the specific and uh, the practical aspects of uh, the surgery, but in basic terms, and then we're gonna carry uh, on Hatan. next week. Uh, with... Hatan? Yeah. Now, before you go to surgery, I think this physiology always fascinates me, what's happening in the retina. And I always uh, wonder. So one of the questions which I used to have is, olden days when the longevity was less, people did not get AMD. I think it's not only light, I think, it's because of uh, aging. So I think there's a, one is about the light and dark related to uh, age-related macular degeneration. And other is aging, I think. So I don't know how to differentiate that. Jaydeep, you get my, my thinking? So uh, I wish that if you avoid a light, you can prevent AMD. I don't think it's totally true. Okay. Oh, yeah. I guess uh, it's very multifactorial condition. So maybe uh, light was not the only factor. I guess a uh, lot of other things, lifestyle related and genetic related, are also crucial. And as you said, aging, the longevity, as you said, has increased. So probably we have are seeing more of AMD now because the lifespan was uh, limited maybe 50 years back, the life expectancy. Yes, Nagesh, you want probably... to Hello, sir. Hi, Nagesh, you are in the OR? Yes, yes, yes. I'm about to go to OR, but uh, actually because the class, ideally we operate uh, in the afternoon after finishing the OPD. But today, because of the class, actually we remain. But anyway, it's nice, nice physiology. What Saraj asked, the point is true. Apart from the only the light exposure, so many factors are there for the development of AMD. But uh, I do not know him. <laughs> but he said, uh, doctor, prior to me, he said very nicely, actually. So many factors are so multifactorial origin, AMD. So, uh, but uh, these things are very important, actually. The, anat the anatomy and functional ability of these, all these cells, molar cells, Glial cells, these are all very important in the physiological process of the light. And also the uh, amount of melanin and the functions of the RPE, they play a very yes. important role. Mm. And uh, especially in the uh, scratching of the uh, bad components from the, uh, the RPE and the, the pump should work properly. So yes, yes. The, uh, the, the RPE protection and the, those, all those functions mentioned in, by Jessica are very, uh, are pretty, pretty important to consider. So uh, yeah, very interesting. We have to recap and review all these things and uh, apply actually. So just uh, talking about basic concepts in uh, vitreo retinal surgery, because before we start uh, sharing the uh, surgeries uh, themselves, I think it's important that we uh, review some of the uh, some of the concepts we we started uh, some uh, weeks ago. And so we have uh, we have here some uh, vitro uh, vitrectomy tips for you. And uh, this is the iBank Foundation. And uh, we have to rem remember that uh, doing vitrectomy, we have to look at the vitreous. So it doesn't matter how you look at the vitreous, but you gotta see the vitreous, whether you use wide angle or we use uh, macular lens, but you gotta see the vitreous. Uh, most important, especially when you have uh, retinal detachments, when you have these uh, membranes, and we have to remove them. If you have this uh, very good wide angle view and you don't look at the uh, macula to see the retinal membrane, for example, it's not gonna work. So you need the appropriate lenses 
to do everything. And uh, we have uh, lots of them. We have the contact systems. We have the non-contact systems. So they all play a role. And uh, which one is better? The, the best one uh, is the best one that you like to use and uh, works for you and uh, works for the patient. And we have so many examples here. Some of these lenses, like the SSV from Vogue, we still use. We uh, use the uh, uh, Biome systems, non-contact as well. So we have macular lenses, all types. And uh, we uh, did the paperwork years ago uh, comparing some of these uh, uh, wide-angle vitrectomy viewing systems. We have here the AVI, we have the uh, ABOS, we have the Biome, and, uh, and actually uh, all of them, they give a special uh, visualization system. But uh, we are talking about this uh, wide-angle. But before wide-angle, we started with uh, the uh, uh, Lander systems, we had the Lander systems and uh, by 1997, 1998, we still used that. We bought those lenses, those prisms lenses, but uh, we just had the, uh, uh, the uh, view from the iFundos. Uh, the overall view was not so sharp, not so good. And then we had to, you remove the vitreous from the periphery with the prism lens rotating it. So things got a lot better. And uh, we have the resume here from the lenses. Uh, by talking about the uh, uh, lens systems, we have the plano concave flat lens. We only uh, saw the iPhone those 20 degrees. It's not much it's if we compare today with uh, 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 for example, Lander's equatorial lens, they have over 100 degrees and uh, uh, 131 degrees in very good visualization up to the equator. The problem is that if you go, if you have a, a, a fake patient and if you go too peripheral, you might touch the lens. So you gotta be careful about that. So there are so many ways now to, to see the fundus. I usually I like to vitrectomy with the wide angle lens, but then I use the macular lens so that I see whatever I'm uh, removing there. I have a sharper vision from the membranes. I see the vitreous actually without having to stain the vitreous. But of course, sometimes you have to stain the vitreous in some situations and also uh, for some special surgeries that we're gonna be mentioning such as macular holes and uh, epiretinal membranes. And uh, so non-contact wide angle uh, lens. By that time, we only had, uh, you know, ABOS, we had, we had the biome, non-contact, but uh, we have a lot more. We have uh, uh, biome offices, Merlin wide angle lens, we cite PWL and uh, ABOS. And uh, maybe most of those used are uh, biome and ABOS. But uh, I've uh, heard some complaints on these uh, visualization systems is that uh, among many disadvantages is that uh, oftentimes when you perform an effluent exchange, you get bubbles in the system. You have bubbles uh, actually on the lens that are not touching the eye and uh, uh, the uh, visualization gets not so clear. But today, this is better because we have the 23, 25, 27 systems. So you don't have much, you know, air or uh, you don't have uh, actually bubbles coming towards your lens. And so things got better for these systems. So that's what, uh, why they improved a lot. And uh, people talk a lot about the biome those days. And uh, also Natarajan has uh, history in the biome uh, since the beginning, I, I'm pretty sure it's much better today as opposed to years ago. And uh, uh, what about the positioning of the infusion line? Usually people uh, put the infusion infrotemporally, but you always have to see the, uh, the tip with the light pipe. It's very common and uh, many people don't worry about that, but they have to worry, special residents and fellows, we have to see the tip 
of the infusion line. Otherwise, you might get these uh, choroidal detachments right at the beginning of the case. So be extra careful on that. And uh, you have here an example of the position of the uh, effusion line infrotemporal, but these other sclerotomies here, superior, supratemporal, supranasal, are very close. So sometimes it's better to be anatomical. So uh, you might get the, a better uh, movement uh, inside the eye if you had this uh, one hour more open to the left and one hour more open to the right. So your moves from uh, the eye uh, and the stabilization would be better for that. And uh, to start the vitrectomy, don't forget to test the cutter for cutting and aspiration, get, getting rid of air bubbles into the system. If you allow the uh, air to uh, come out first or even before getting into the eye, I had this nurse that would aspirate to, to, uh, through the line, the air. So it's better for you to go on and start your surgery. Testing the light pipe, fiberotic probe. You have to test it uh, whether it's good or not. The same for the laser, because sometimes it is detached from uh, the tip. And so sometimes it's broken, the, the fiber, and you got to change it right at the beginning of the surgery. Adjustment of the infusion pressure. And uh, you, in the past, we did not have uh, so many uh, cutters, uh, retractor machines as good as today. So we had to rely on raising the bottle and uh, getting the bottle uh, lower to get the, actually the uh, drop of pressure higher or lower. But today it's better that we have the uh, better control systems. And so we can by the touch of the finger and uh, control that. Uh, and starting the core vitrectomy, start with the mid vitreous, hold the instruments firm, and then you advance posteriorly. What does that mean? Is that the same force made from uh, one hand is the same for the other hand, from the right, from the left. And then you have to switch hands and uh, like uh, the light pipe on the right and the cutter on the left, you, you got to apply the same forces, the same uh, directions, and then move the eye. Uh, if you have the lens very carefully, not to touch the lens. And uh, we usually teach the, that to our residents. And uh, by removing the posterior hyaloid, for example, after you've done the uh, vitrectomy, you got to have a good lens for that, especially a macular lens if you want to see it actually. And uh, it's mostly, as we said in the last presentations from uh, Ashwara, uh, it's more engaged in the peripheral area. So sometimes you need special instruments like a soft tip extrusion cannula. So uh, to actually uh, dislodge the uh, hyaloid and avoiding touching the, uh, the retina there. So a soft tip would be uh, good. And sometimes you have to, if you don't have a soft tip of your, or if you don't want to use it with the aspiration from the cutter, you, you can detach the hyaloid as well. And there are some signs of engagement and we mentioned uh, the fishtail uh, sign when you have the uh, soft tip bent towards the vitreous. And uh, in the past, we, we still have today you know, the M MVR blades uh, for 23 and uh, uh, smaller gauges, but uh, the peak, the cutter, and others to remove the vitreous are not very, very, very uh, necessary because we have very good cutters today. And uh, be, be, beware of uh, eye movements, of course, and uh, anesthetist uh, plays a very important role in this. And uh, going towards the peripheral vitrectomy, we have the cutter position facing in, up, or out towards the retina or away from the, uh, the retina and uh, considerations uh, uh, towards the lens. So if you uh, use the curve, best thing is for you to start in the core, core vitrectomy and then when you move to the peripheral vitrectomy, you still have to see the opening of the curve. Otherwise, you might get the peripheral retina and cause, a, you know, a break and a retinal detachment right at the beginning of the surgery. And uh, this is not good if the surgery is not for a retinal detachment. So you've got to see always the uh, uh, opening of the cutter 
and uh, go to the periphery, but still seeing it, but don't go, don't go to peripheral in order not to touch the lens. But then after you engage the vitreous, you just uh, uh, follow the circular pathway so you don't aspirate, you don't pull on the retinal periphery. And uh, the more you are at the retinal periphery, the, the better to use the high speed, uh, speed cutting. So uh, you won't cause uh, attraction, so, but you, use, you may use low speed cutting accordingly, depending on the uh, vitreous haziness and tractants that you find on the way. And so you have to be observing everything. You, you cannot cut on, cut on the vitreous without seeing what you're doing. You always have to take a look uh, at uh, the tip of your instruments. And during the uh, air food exchange, and uh, we're gonna go on in more details next week because we are uh, just mentioning some basic principles. And uh, uh, we have the, um, the pump, the uh, air infusion. We do active, passive aspiration and removal of subretinal fluid. When we perform the air fluid exchange, we've got to be very careful not to uh, aspirate very, very uh, fast and uh, uh, we, we gotta decide whether we use the active aspiration or passive aspiration. Let me give you an example. If you are in the diabetic retinopathy uh, case, and then you have too much hemorrhage, and then sometimes you have to aspirate actively and also raise the bottle and raise intraocular pressure, or otherwise the bleeding will go on. And if the bleeding from the vessel, that very tiny vessel is going on, you gotta, uh, think of doing the endocautery there and the raising the vessel so you can go on with the surgery. So be extra careful. But uh, for air fluid exchanges, it's safer to use the passive aspiration, but some experienced surgeons, they like the active aspiration. So things go faster, but still some liquid very close to the optic nerve, you have to switch to the uh, back flush cannula and uh, go on and finish the surgery with the passive aspiration, it's safer. And uh, it's still something uh, where a device I give you is that after vitrectomy you do, you have this air inside the eye and the vision gets a little hazy because even if you have some patients with uh, uh, intraocular lens or aphakic and, uh, or pseudophakic that, uh, where uh, when the uh, air comes to the anterior chamber, the image, from the posterior pole gets, uh, you know, hazy. So sometimes it's better to use the macular lens with not so much magnification from the zoom of the microscope. So you have the zoom out, you put the macular lens and then you go to the uh, focus from the uh, microscope and then you see what you have still left in terms of uh, uh, fluid inside the eye and with the, uh, back flush can, can only remove it easily with a good visualization from the uh, macular lens. So these are some tips and uh, I will show you these uh, in a few minutes, this video, just a resume. And uh, is sutures needed? Today we often don't uh, perform, you know, we, we perform 23, 25, 27, we, we don't uh, give a stitch. But I myself, sometimes I prefer for silicone field uh, eye patients uh, to uh, put a, a, a suture of vicryl crossing the conge. In this way, to avoid any silicone from the intraocular pressure that comes a little higher after the exchange coming uh, beneath and underneath the conge. So sometimes that depends. And uh, gas, there are uh, many options of gas. We're gonna go over you know, with uh, gas and uh, next week, it's, we are gonna be more specific there next week, but then we have uh, many, many options and uh, we gotta be very careful by doing a vitrectomy, not to put high concentrations, very high concentrations to avoid uh, uh, raising too much intraocular pressure. We have here uh, example from uh, SF6 and C3F8, you know, you actually 100% of SF6 uh, duplicates and uh, C3F8 makes it four times. So we gotta be uh, looking at the uh, non-expensible concentrations. And uh, if we have 
just a simple vitrectomy for vitreous hemorrhage. And uh, we did the cautery and everything and uh, everything is cool and uh, we don't see any active bleeding. So we don't need to leave the gas there for a long time. And if the patient is faking a lot of gas for a long standing, uh, you know, long, long time might uh, cause a cataract. And so for macular holes, for example, you don't need a non-expensable concentration, but you could get a little expensable concentration. It's just a matter of mathematics. And then you measure and uh, avoid intraocular pressure from uh, raising too much. And uh, as you have here, the percentage uh, from uh, SF6, non-expensible, non uh, 20%, uh, C3F8, uh, 14% or more depending on the type of the uh, C3F8. The, uh, the, uh, some articles, they, they uh, put it a little higher. And uh, uh, as I was mentioning, the, uh, the average expansion is very important to, to be considered. Always check on the retinal periphery. I had this professor, Dr. Alan Berger in Toronto. After we did this uh, vitrectomy, all cases, before we closed off, we just uh, took the interact to take a very good look at the retinal periphery to see whether all everything was uh, fine and that there were no uh, iatrogenic breaks or holes that we could might have been uh, have created with the cutter itself and tractants. And so we have to see, and if necessary, on the spot we do some laser or if we don't, we even do some cryo not very much cryo to avoid PVR. And so uh, just uh, remember the boundaries from where you are coming in the eye and uh, thinking of the overall thing and thinking of the lens and thinking prospicata, prosplena and the orocerata and especially the vitreous base because the vitreous base is uh, a broad band in the retinal periphery and uh, you gotta be very careful not to pull on the vitreous base very forcefully. And some cases demand more vitro base, uh, vitro base removal. In some cases don't uh, demand too much vitro base removal. And uh, as you see here, the vitro base on the uh, uh, right side. So uh, be extra careful because the patient might have some uh, uh, normal, normal variants and they will have some uh, pre-existing uh, breaks, holes, or uh, oral base. And when you remove the vitreous, a hole, for example, has no more support, even though it's around, you might not need to do laser, but uh, after you've done this vitrectomy, of course, it's better approach to do laser around because you don't have the vitreous anymore for a support and then the liquid might go inside the hole and create a retinal detachment. Uh, and very interesting here, and uh, we are gonna be more specific next uh, week about the uh, types of illumination. You gotta be very careful, otherwise we could uh, have this uh, toxicity from the excessive light. And uh, the good things that I advise you during vitrectomy is that you have uh, here all brands that we use. The best thing for you to avoid uh, light toxicity, regardless of uh, which brand you are using, is not to go too close to the retina. Otherwise, you're gonna, as uh, Jessica mentioned in, in the, her lecture, you're gonna be uh, making stimulation from the retina. And if it's too excessive, you might get this, uh, uh, burn on the retina if you get too much light. So the best thing is not to get too close. That's why we have to use uh, macular lens. You have to use the uh, zooming in, zooming out from the microscope and the macular lens uh, allow you to see the uh, retina closer without having to approach it very close. So never put the light on the retina unless it's extremely necessary. The light you should be putting straight on the retina would be uh, the laser, not the illumination pipe. And so, uh, as I was mentioning, there are some calculations on the, what light pipe uh, came as a result. And uh, we're gonna go over that next week. And uh, perfluorocarbon, 
to, uh, we use to attack the ret uh, retina, lift the lens up, move the intraocular lens up. As I have this technique, stand up technique, we did the vitrectomy and then we use the uh, perforocarbon liquid just to, to make the intraocular lens go uh, vertical. So you remove it. And uh, most use of the PFC is the, for uh, retinal detachment. It's a very good thing to do. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, share now this, uh, this small video. This small video from uh, vitro macular tractum syndrome. Is, uh, this is just uh, to make a resume of what we just mentioned. So we have uh, the, the vitrectomy here going on. We have a uh, tote hyaloid, and they are doing this ILMP. And uh, it's important to have the uh, OCT pre and post op, and uh, always perform an OCT comparing when the first uh, patient was first seen. And then he took a while for him to show up again. We have all the uh, FAs and uh, OCTs we compare, we have this tractum. And uh, so how would we get rid of this tractum? Looks like this uh, <laughs> small animal without uh, damaging the retina. So it's very tricky. So the patient is faking, you have here the infrotemporal uh, infusion. And uh, I'm using, I'm doing the core vitrectomy now with a good zooming and uh, uh, doing peripheral vitrectomy, you see the opening of the gutter. You see it all time. It's not hidden. Otherwise, it could cause a peripheral traction. And now I'm using the uh, wide angle lens. That's the only way I could see and look at the vitreous without uh, causing too much traction. You see the uh, uh, how close I am towards the retina in very gentle movements without uh, opening that defect even more. So I'm pulling on uh, the, uh, Hudson, uh, uh, the retinal sorry tissue to here and the removing Hudson, the hyaloid, video is not playing. very gentle. So uh, in this way, you see the reflex of the retina there. So you see that very total reflective, total reflective Dr. hyaloid Hudson, is uh, uh, still adherent, very adherent. Hudson. So you got to find the, uh, the break uh, from the Umesha. Umesha. Now I, I did it and uh, I'm following peripheral with uh, by removing the vitreous can you hear uh, very, uh, slowly and now you don't have uh, the vitreous anymore they're attached and uh, I didn't cause any damage to the retina itself so I'm very close see I'm very close but uh, with uh, uh, engaging still some remnants of uh, posterior uh, vitreous there. And now I'm using this uh, very good macular lens. So I, I even approach a little more, but go, don't go inside the eye with the high magnification. Make the magnification very far. And then when you are inside the eye, seeing your instruments, and then you make it closer. Now using the brilliant blue. So in this way, still the patient is fake and uh, we did not touch the lens. You have to, you may see the uh, opening of the uh, the gutter there all the time, and I'm removing some peripheral vitreous at the macula. Some still uh, may have been left there, but now I go on with a very good, still good magnification. I don't have vitreous left, so I go straight to the internal limiting membrane, and uh, the procedure gets easier now because I have a very good view from the Isandus, as you see. Dr. Hudson. We are going towards the end. And so if uh, Dr. you grab the ILM, then you take it Dr. and then we take Dr. it and uh, leave it and go back. But the thing is that you gotta be Dr. very Dr. slow and you're gonna go see uh, the end result from that after removing all these very slowly because you have that defect from the OCT from the beginning. So if I go too fast and then I will cause this uh, uh, macular hole or a tear or it's going to get worse anyway. Still, you see the lens is clear. 
we have the uh, uh, instruments put appropriately, and then we are going to be doing some laser because we never know whether you cause any peripheral traction, but don't go to uh, peripheral. I'm rotating the eye, so I'm doing the uh, laser temporal. So I'm rotating the eye nasally uh, before doing the, coming to the end, the air from the exchange. And now uh, by doing this uh, procedure here, I see the, uh, the results. I can see the results. And uh, we are coming to the end. Uh, we are going to discuss okay. now the case. And uh, you have the Hello? OTT from the uh, post office. Dr. Hudson, can you Hudson, hear us? Hudson, Hudson. You see, you see uh, that traction huh? is not there Hudson? anymore. In the, if you compare the, uh, the two OCTs. Hello, Hudson. Now it is okay, but if you compare the two OCTs, you're gonna see it uh, that uh, that appearance from the beginning is not there anymore. So very good, thank you very much for listening to that. And I think uh, we we now showed you more of the uh, the techniques and the applied uh, vitrectomy and uh, more details we're gonna be carrying on you know, next week. And uh, Jadip, uh, do you have any comment on that? Uh, can you hear us, Dr. Hudson? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, we couldn't see the video while you were playing it, actually. We tried to uh, talk to you, but I guess you couldn't listen to us. The video oh, was not okay. playing. Oh, you didn't, you didn't see the video? It was not sharing? <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it was not. Uh, we tried to talk to you, but I guess your audio was also not reach. Our audio was not reaching you. Okay, but you couldn't, uh, you could listen to me, no? Yeah, yeah, we could listen. Sir. We could listen. Oh, I'm very sorry about that. I thought we, the video was... Anyways, I, I think, uh, was this the same video which we uh, saw like a uh, couple of weeks back for the vitromacular traction uh, with the central area which you were peeling with the, staining with brilliant blue and then peeling it? Yeah, yeah. Can you see the video now or just go to the uh, points? You see it now? Yeah, yeah, now. Yes, yeah. we can see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, just, just a resume. We have this patient here. I will just go to the steps. And uh, you have the uh, vitromacular tracton syndrome over there. And uh, the patient, you know, I'm going very fast now, is a, a fake patient. And uh, here I was mentioning how you get the hyaloid detached by uh, taking a very good look of the uh, vitreous engagements and uh, detaching the vitreous, having a way to cut the vitreous and uh, remove it without, the problem here is that you have to go very slow. Otherwise, this is the defect you have, see it, the defect? This is the retina defect. And uh, if you go too fast, you might break it and cause a, a macular hole right away. So that's a, a, a different video. And so very gentle maneuvers are required. And uh, by uh, using the appropriate lens, and uh, I'm right at the middle of the vitreous now, using the uh, appropriate lens with the macular lens, you may see the posterior pole and you have more details, even though uh, you have some air and then doing an fluid exchange with a uh, macular lens, you get uh, a very good visualization I was mentioning. And then you are able to use uh, brilliant blue and uh, get a very good grip and view from uh, the retina. And here I mentioned the ILM view. And, uh, by doing the ILM view, you have accurate vision with uh, uh, macular lens. And uh, what I wanted to mention is that you, you gotta be very slow, otherwise that defect is gonna enlarge. And so you do uh, uh, 
the uh, ILM Hill with a very sharp visualization uh, system. And uh, effort exchange again. And then you have uh, the end result here. You don't see the, uh, that defect anymore. And you can take a very good look at the OCT here. You see close to the normal anatomy. And the good thing as I was telling about the vitrectomy, when you go to peripheral, you gotta be extra careful if you go peripheral, not to create that hole or break or otherwise. Uh, and so you have to keep seeing the tip of the uh, cutter all time. Otherwise you might create this hole or break. I hope you listened. And now I, I did a resume from the, uh, the video and uh, this is good though. And uh, do you want to make any comment uh, Jadip, now that I, I showed the video? <laughs> yes, yeah, I, we, we could see it. It was very nice video. So, yeah, well, uh, as far as uh, beginners, for beginners are concerned, you have already like covered everything, what <laughs> stepwise, what they should do and how they should proceed. Uh, just one thing, as you mentioned, that there are multiple types of wide angle viewing systems. So, before any beginner is starting the uh, surgical training or in the initial stages of his training, they should know uh, the wide angle viewing system and the microscope that they are using and also the vitrectomy machine they should know thoroughly. So they don't have to struggle during the case because you, you need to use your both hands and both legs when you're doing any posterior segment case, so especially a vitrectomy. So there has to be perfect coordination. You should know where, what switch is situated on the foot pedal. And you should know how the machine works, what are the settings which are uh, necessary for various steps of the surgery. So those are the things which uh, a beginner sh should know before they start, as well as the focusing of the microscope with the wide angle wind system before you starting the case. That is something which I would like to add to whatever you said. So whenever you start the case, the first thing after taking all the precautions as Dr. Hudson has uh, told regarding making the sclerotomies and checking whether the infusion line is inside before starting. And before you start doing the vitrectomy, the first step is to focus uh, the microscope in appropriate way so that you can proceed with your surgery. So ideally what is described is you need to uh, increase the magnification to as high as possible and then focus the tip of your cutter or your instrument inside in the mid vitreous cavity. So once you have focused that perfectly, then you can reduce the zoom and then you get a good working distance where you will have a crisp focus below and above that point where you have focused. So generally, if you focus in the mid vitreous cavity, you can see the retina as well as the anterior vitreous. Once you have gotten good focusing, only then you can vitrectomy because without visualization, it's very difficult to uh, start vitrectomy, and that is where most of the early in the early stages, the residents or the fellows uh, have a lot of difficulty. And once you can't visualize, you can't proceed. So that is something which I would like to add to this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I like coming inside. Uh, the eye for the vitrectomy, I like uh, the zoom a little out, so I see my tips entering. And then, and then I, I, I find a, a good focus from uh, the instruments, the tip of the instruments, the retina, and uh, I, I don't like uh, having this very large in zoom inside before entering, otherwise you don't see your tip. So I like to see the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. And then I, with so the first, pack, correct. as you mentioned, so with when you enter, yeah, when you enter, I think you should have zoom out so that you can see the entire yeah, uh, yeah. fundus and your tip. But when you're focusing uh, the, the biome or whatever instrument you have, you can uh, increase the zoom and then focus and then zoom out and start doing your vitrectomy. The reason for focusing, having a high zoom while focusing is the depth of focus uh, is increased. Like 
if you are focusing at a very small point with a high zoom then once you zoom out the uh, planes above that as well as below that will be clear in you know in you will have a good depth of focus basically throughout the case yeah another thing i like to use is uh, after you do you did this uh, general and core and critical vitrectomy when you go uh, doing as I, I showed the video uh, in the net fluid exchange sometimes the air comes in between and then uh, you get out of focus but then if you have uh, uh, you know the zoom out to see the whole thing and use the macular lens and then you have a very good visualization from where you are at near the optic nerve and avoid touching the optic nerve at the air for the exchange so I switch, I switch the lens and uh, sometimes uh, that works very good for me and uh, very good advice. And uh, you have to see everything, otherwise you could get a peripheral break. So the vitrectomy, you really have to go after the vitreous everywhere, not only central, but peripheral. Don't you agree, uh, Nageswar? Yes, yes, absolutely, I agree. <clears throat> so, because the focusing is very important actually at the beginning. Otherwise, uh, chance of pulpic eyes, particularly if you will misjudgment makes uh, touching the lens or sometimes going uh, peripherally cutting the retina, these uh, problems are actually encountered if you will find difficulty in focusing. What uh, Jaydeep has told, Dr. Dr. Jaydeep has told, initially one should uh, focus the midvitreous with the instrument tip. Once it is being focused, then you can zoom out and uh, do your vitreous surgery. Wide angle field you will get. And particularly the light pipe, holding the light pipe is very important for the beginners actually. They should not uh, take the light pipe very deep. Holding at the first planar region that will focus wide, wide, wide. It will actually, it will show the view of the vitreous, entire vitreous field. So, so this is very important by light by holding the light pipe and holding the cutter. Even the cutting instrument, cutting whatever the instruments you take into the vitreous, it should be in acute angle it should go. Not like this. Suppose if you like this, in fakic patients, chance of injuring the lens is very high. Even if the laser you will do while lasering the retina also, that is very important. Suppose uh, finding difficulty with acute uh, angling, you may find difficulty in actually going to the opposite uh, side like suppose from the nasal side you are putting the uh, holding the laser probe and uh, going to the temporal side it makes difficulty but still uh, suppose if you tilt the tilt the this one probe then chance of hitting the lens is more in that cases one can uh, exchange the this one instruments other way suppose you can bring the instrument from light pipe you can hold in the right hand left hand you hold the laser probe like this you can exchange it so this is very important for the beginners and as you will gain the experience, more expertise will come into the play, then you can, the manipulation will be very easy. Yeah, yeah. Well, but nice, yeah. One, 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 wonderfully you said. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's an honor for me to be here. Amit, Amit, you want to comment? I have few comments while I was trying to note few points I would like to add. Uh, excellent presentation. First, uh, I, am I audible? Yeah, it's good. Uh, 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 so, uh, first of all, every step can, if not done properly, can be a problematic thing, including even a normal draping of the patient. So, utmost care has to be taken while draping, more so in a vitreoretinal surgery, because if the nasal area tends to give way, the lens will continuously fog and the view of your surgery would be hampered drastically. So, utmost care which I think uh, even uh, while we were students, postgraduates, uh, we were told uh, always to drape, keep a sticker uh, around the nasal area. So that is one thing which has to be taken care of. Uh, before starting the surgery, check the bottle height. If uh, in machines where there is a vented gas fluid infusion, you don't have to take care. You just put 25, 30 mm of IOP. But with machines which don't have their gravity based the bottle height should be checked and always should be somewhere around 18 millim uh, 18 inches from the eye level because otherwise if you're operating at a very high level you will end up with a pale disc an excellent surgery but a pale disc uh, then always
always check the inclusion when you are doing it inside whether it is inside if most of the times many times when we operate an rd it would be a very hypotonus eye if needed we can inject saline into the eye uh, with a 30 gauge needle which will help uh, build the pressure and then make the trocar entry rather than going with the trocar and causing injury to the retina or the choroid uh, always keep the conscious effort as told by dr uh, rao sir uh, that a conscious effort that light pipe should be at the tip of the port just inside the eye and not going very inside and touching i have seen one of the student touching the retina uh, with the light pipe while doing vitrectomy in one of the other areas so uh, always always note where your light pipe is your left hand is very important if you are using in the uh, say for example in the left hand your light pipe should you should be always aware of um, one important point was to check the periphery however i have seen when the starters who start vitrectomy while checking the periphery they inadvertently hit the retina with the light pipe or with the cutter so that conscious effort the best way is to see with the indirect but sometimes we see with the uh, by while the assistant is depressing we see through the light pipe only and that way we have to be very cautious of um starters usually end up fishing in the vitreous cavity and my suggestion would be to clear vitreous in one area and then go to the other area that way you will be more systematically thorough in clearing the vitreous always um and uh, when you when you have a choroidal detachment you don't go oblique with the trocar entry you can go straight you may need to suture but that is not a problem all right very good comments and uh uh you have to share this same force from one instrument to the other and you have to be able to switch the instruments and uh actually if you need to peel with the left hand you got to be able to do that and uh, these are important concepts it's not easy but uh i think it takes some time to to learn and uh this is uh you know good advice Hello, Arshan. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, I have uh, I have to go to work. Cases are waiting oh, yeah. for me. Huh? Yeah. Next. Great. Thank I have you. you next time. Thank, yeah, you, thank very you very much. much. And thank, thank you for participating much. to the <laughs> to Red Nose song. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Is uh, Natarajan around? So, anybody wants to comment uh, more on uh, what, what we explained? I'm I'm putting in the internet for you some some of the. Uh, uh, maybe we can. Uh, somebody can ask questions. Uh, few of our fellows. Yeah. Carlos, you wanna ask anything? I think uh, they are Very nice meeting. Thank you. Do you do you enjoy the uh, surgery, uh, Carlos? You are in the OR, Satam Sensirur? No. Ah, okay. Not now. You are not in the OR anymore. So that's all right, and. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here again next week. We are going to be explaining a little more on, uh, you know, more detailed uh, aspects from the uh, gas, the expansion of gases and uh, uh, intraocular fluids and the uh, cutter rates and the different tips we use. We're going to be a little more specific. I, I put some uh, articles for you to read it up. This is very interesting. Okay, Ashwara, do you want to yeah. come? Yes, sir. Do you have any questions, Ashwara? No, sir. It was actually a good presentation, very clear. But I just need to read up once about it so that I can, you know, like it, I can get reinforced all these points. 
ಫಿಜಿಯಾಲಜಿ and uh, i put on the chat some articles interesting articles as well as that surgery and uh, i hope you enjoyed and uh, see you next week yes yes doctor yes, it was sir, nice yes definitely thank you thank you so thank much you. sir thank have you have a great day thank you for knowledge thank you yes sir same bye bye bye, bye. bye.